Welcome everyone. I'm Michel Adev Jones. I'm the executive director of the Synchronous Institute and founder of the Temporalities, Rhythms and Complexity Lab that is organizing this 2024 research symposium series. This year, our goal is to keep exploring rhythms related contributions as we choose to focus more specifically on rhythm analysis. With my dear friends and colleagues and co-hosts Fadia Daka and Gaia Del Negro, we have started this series with an introduction on rhythm analysis and rhythmic intelligence, followed by a very rich presentation made by Stanley Blue two weeks ago. We are delighted to welcome today Dr. Maria Tombuku. Maria Tombuku is a scholar in gender and feminist studies and a Leverhulme major research fellow for the project Numbers and Narratives a feminist genealogy of automatographies. She has held academic positions in a number of institutions, including professor of feminist studies at the University of East London, affiliated professor in gender studies at Linnaeus University, Sweden, and adjunct professor at Griffith University in Australia. She's a member of the scientific board of the Anna Harent Center for Political Studies at the University of Verona in Italy, and of the International Advisory Board for the Center for the Study of Storytelling, Experientiality, and Memory at the University of Turku in Finland. Maria's research activity develops in the areas of philosophies and epistemologies in the social sciences, feminist theories, narrative analytics, and archival research. Writing histories of the present is the central focus of her work, currently configured as an assemblage of feminist genealogies. She's the author of a significant number of monographs, co-authored books, edited volumes and articles and chapters published and translated in many languages. So we're really happy to welcome her today. Maria, thank you very much for being with us and you have the mic. Thank you very much, Michelle and uh, Gaia and Monica for organizing this seminar series and for inviting me. I am very excited to be part of it uh, because today I will have the opportunity to talk about uh, my own genealogy into rhythm, <laughs> but also highlight how much uh, rhythm is uh, at the center of my current project with uh, women mathematicians, uh, uh, philosophical and literary and autobiographical uh, writings um, in the 18th and 19th centuries Europe. So, when I look back at my work with rhythm analysis, I often wonder what it is that triggered my interest in this notion. And this reflection takes me back to my PhD years when I had found that space and particularly college spaces were crucial in the constitution of the new woman who had just been allowed to enter the first university associated women's colleges at Cambridge. And I quote here from my book on women education and the self a Foucauldian perspective which came out of my PhD in 2003. I had written then, in working simultaneously with multi-level differences, I have tried to experiment with a sort of rhythm analysis, since as Henri Lefebvre has put it, what we live are rhythms, rhythms experienced subjectively. In doing my PhD, I had actually combined genealogy with ethnography, using ethnography to interrogate and challenge women, uh, women's present in education, um, and using a genealogy to look back and excavate their past. In this context, it was not only as an analytical lens that uh, spatio-temporal rhythms emerged in my work, but also as a methodological approach or rather orientation in working between ethnography and genealogy. 
It was then that the idea of thinking of rhythm alongside music that first emerged. And here I quote from uh, my chapter in a book I edited at the time with Stephen J. Ball on genealogy and ethnography. I want to create a plane of thinking in which genealogy and ethnography can be brought to work or perhaps sound together, as indeed different notes can be composed into a musical piece. I suggest that working with genealogy and ethnography should be seen in the context of music and Novalis' uh, philosophical suggestion that all method is rhythm. My reference in this early stage of my engagement with rhythm analysis was, of course, Henri Lefebvre and his little book as he refers to it. This little book, he writes, does not conceal its ambition. It proposes nothing less than to found a new science, a new field of knowledge, the analysis of rhythms. Since in our previous seminar two weeks ago, we had an excellent exposition of Lefebvre's work, I won't expand on his take of rhythm analysis. I will only add that my engagement with rhythm analysis went on, uh, as my engagement with rhythm analysis went on, I was able to go deeper in Lefebvre's use of rhythm analysis, see its connection uh, with his uh, major work, The Production of Space, which I think is very important to see, to see rhythm analysis in the context uh, of this work. It was then that I deployed um, rhythm analysis in my work in archives that I was able to trace the slow rhythm of Lefebvre's influence in the Anglophone world. And I quote here uh, from the book, uh, The Archive Project, Archival Research in the Social Sciences, that I co-authored with uh, uh, three uh, feminist sociologist colleagues in the UK. It was only at the end of his academic life when perhaps he had more time to indulge his love for music being a pianist as well as an intellectual and activist, that Lefebvre wrote his small book on rhythm analysis. The book was published in French after his death in 1992. However, it took 12 years to be translated in English, being published in 2004, which explains perhaps why this approach uh, has yet to be taken up more fully in methodological discussions in the social sciences. The fact that Lefebvre's three volume critique of everyday life, wherein rhythm analysis appears in context, was only published in its full form in 2014, and this throws further light on the neglect of his approach. So far, I have shown how my encounter with rhythm analysis was through the analysis of archival documents, inscribing the female self, either as autobiographies, diaries, journals, and letters. But things moved forward beyond Lefebvre when I conducted research with oral histories of migrant and refugee women in Greece, recounting stories of forced displacement. This was when the connection between narrative sounds and music entered more fully in my analytical toolbox. In taking this approach, I was inspired by Bruce Chatwin's book Songlines, 
a term uh, for the First Nations people of Australia for Juringa Line or Dreaming Track, which is not easily translatable. It is at once a map, a long narrative poem, and the foundation of an Aboriginal's religious and traditional life, the marrow of their identity. The melodic contour of the song describes the land over which the song passes. Uh, I quote here from Chadwin, of course. Certain phrases, certain combinations of musical notes are uh, thought to describe the actions of an, ans of an ancestor's feet. An expert songman would count how many times he has crossed a river or scaled a ridge and be able to calculate where and how far along the song line he was. A musical phrase is a map reference. Music is a memory bank for finding one's way about the world. For an outsider, the song line Sacred Truth is inaccessible, its mechanism fantastically complex. It is secret, and there are penalties for those who transgress. But to a writer like Chadwin, searching for the essence of uh, wandering, it was so attractive to imagine that the meaning of a country could be established by the stories composed across its landscape. In the past, I have written with colleagues about narrative analysis beyond the imperative of coherence. Post-colonial philosopher Edouard Glissant has importantly argued for the right to opacity, highlighting the importance of relation without understanding, as he puts it, as a ground for freedom. While asking migrant and refugee women in Lesbos and Athens to tell me the story of how they traveled to Greece, there were two levels where I encountered this moving experience of relating in opacity. First, it was while listening to stories in a language I could not understand, in the short interval before translation, while I was looking the storyteller in the eye. The translation was uh, synchronous, so the interpreter was next to me and I was moving in between languages. During these fleeting moments, I felt that it was the rhythm of words, the musicality of the voice and the facial movements that wove the fabric of relation, leaving traces of embodied knowledge. It was in the interval between the opacity of unrecognizable speech and the clarity of translation in the interstices of language that I could feel the texture of the weave, the sound of narratives. Sounding does not create meaning, neither is it about conveying emotions. It is more about being exposed to the opacity of feeling the world and the other. In Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy, life emerges from spatial and temporal interstices. The in-between zones of every living cell, as well as the intervals between contrasting moments notes, acts, or events. Rhythm is what brings both the temporal and the spatial dimensions together, the Dieu de Bess has eloquently noted, and I quote here from de Bess, rhythm of the living, rhythm of the creative process, rhythm of events, end of quote and the rhythm of spoken words, I would add. 
Zahra's story of escaping an abusive husband in Iran and fleeing to Greece via Turkey, walking in the wilderness was such a moment. We were walking in the cold for three days and three nights. There were many people. We were walking and walking. We were hungry. There was nothing to eat. There was no water to drink. I only had a packet of biscuits and I was giving it to my mom and my nephew. It was horrible. So you see how I created a poem without changing any of what Zahra said. So I have not made any interventions, but I created a poem following the rhythm, not of her spoken uh, word, orality, because that was in Farsi, and of course I didn't understand Farsi, but I created the poem uh, through the rhythm of how I was listening to it. And in, in a paper I have published, I, I made this transition rhythm from orality uh, to orality. So the poem is through my listening, not through her own speech, following the ethnopoetic tradition, of course. Migrant and refugee women's stories thus became songs and I followed their rhythm while listening to them. But when I moved on to my current research project of writing a feminist genealogy of automathographies, that is tracing the process of becoming a woman mathematician in the early and late modern periods in Europe, through studying women's autobiographical, literary and philosophical writings, the need to approach rhythm in literature made me rethink the concept in its philosophical history well before and after Lefebvre. Let's go to the beginning then. Rhythm's etymological roots lie in the Greek word rhythmos, being Greek is very easy for me to follow it, which derives from the verb rin, to flow, and the suffix thmos, which denotes any measured flow or movement. Among the pre-Socratic philosophers, Heraclitus famously held that everything flows, tapangari, thus ascribing to rhythm a cosmic significance. This line of thought that takes the concept of rhythm as flow continues today in contemporary process philosophy. And I have already referred, of course, to uh, Alfred North Whitehead and to Didier de Bez. But not all linguists agree about the etymology of the word. In his often cited essay, The Notion of Rhythm in its Linguistic Expression, Emile Bonveniste traces the root of the word in the pre-Socratic uh, philosophers, in the historian Herodotus, as well as the tragedians. But he argues that rhythmos, rhythm, in their work, always meant form, schema or figure, and never really derived from the uh, verb to flow. And as I will show later on in, in my talk, I actually make a combination between these two roots, the flow and the form. Plato's consideration of rhythm is more socio-cultural as expressed in his well-known definition, um, order within movement is called rhythm while Aristotle in his Poetics re refers to rhythm as a medium for mimesis. The medium of um, imitation, mimesis, is rhythm, language and melody, but these may be employed either separately or in combination. 
Finally, Aristides Quintilani, Quintilianus, in his essay on music, creates a tripartite schema for rhythm. First, it is applied to bodies that do not move. Second, to anything that moves. And third, it has a specific application to sound. It is a system of durations put together in some kind of order. And you can read more about this very rich philosophical tradition in this excellent uh, vo volume that you see in the slide, The Philosophy of Rhythm. Philosophical theories of rhythm in the modern era include Rousseau with his entry on rhythm in the Encyclopédie and his later Dictionary of Music. In the beginning of the 19th century, Schelling proposed that it is through rhythm that humans, and I quote from Schelling, impose variety or diversity onto everything, end of quote. At the end of the century, Nietzsche's early lecture, Rhythmic Researches, distinguished what he saw as Greek mathematical uh, rhythms from the fluid living rhythms of the body. Influenced by Schopenhauer's philosophy of music, Nietzsche found the primality of will in rhythm and dance. And he has famously written, and I quote, I would only believe in a God who knew how to dance. My point of offering some glimpses in the rich philosophical history on rhythm is to give the context of my own approach to rhythm in my current project, which starts from the great debate on rhythm in the 20th century between Henri Bergson's process philosophy and Gaston Bachelard's uh, phenomenology. Bergson's work on time, duration, and memory became, of course, largely influential. But in the dialectic of duration, Bachelard took a critical stance, not only vis-à-vis -vis the notion of continuity and the Bergsonian idea of duration, but also to the image of rhythm as flow. Bachelard actually borrows the notion of rhythm analysis from the work of the Portuguese philosopher Lucio Alberto Pinheiro dos Santos, and what he proposes is an active rhythm analytic theory that never loses sight of the fact that rhythm constitutes, and I quote here from Bachelard, the basis of the dynamics of both life and the psyche. For Bacelar, time should not be understood as a continuous flow in which the past is prolonged into the present, as in Bergson, of course, but as fractured and constantly riven, the present constantly breaking away from its past. Moreover, Bacelar argued that music's action is discontinuous, and it is our emotional resonance that gives it continuity. As a phenomenologist, Bachelard argued that continuity and duration in music is reconstructed in reverse, as he puts it, by the experiencing subject. By advancing rhythm as a fundamental temporal notion, Bachelard aimed to replace Bergson's conceptualization of time as duration with a reading of time in which continuity is the result of a rhythmic interplay. Thus, the conceptualization of rhythm fits in this argument against Bergsonian duration. But just to clarify here, Rhythm is constitutive of a singular temporal existence for both philosophers. 
But why for Bergson rhythm is the expression of duration in a distinct phenomenon, for Bacelar rhythm is taken as the temporal architecture that the subject constructs in giving form to their experience of duration and continuity. And of course, it is important to um, take Bachelard very seriously, given that uh, Lefebvre was mostly influenced by Bachelard in his own rhythm analysis. But it was not only uh, Lefebvre, but also Deleuze uh, who were influenced by Bachelard, and particularly Deleuze in his collaboration with Gattari. So my philosophical toolbox includes um, their notion of the refrain, ritornello, they call it, and I have used it actually uh, when working with um, migrant and refugee women's um, um, musical songs. For Deleuze and Gattari, rhythms orchestrate otherwise chaotic instances that elude measure and can be found in the passages between milieus or environments. And on this plane of analysis, their concept of their refrain plays an important role in their exploration of various themes, including philosophy, art, culture, as well as human and non-human relations and entities. The refrain refers to any repetitive and patterned activity or mode of being that creates a sense of order or structure in what they refer as the chaosmos. In this configuration, the refrain is not only about repetition, but also about becoming and transformation. Here it is also important to note that although related, rhythm is different from the refrain, and it is actually from refrains that rhythm is born in music and beyond. And we had an interesting discussion with Michelle just before the seminar started about the importance of repetitions and recurrences in thinking about rhythms. So I think the refrain is a good concept to, to return to. What I have further added in my current approach on rhythm is uh, Philippe Laquella Bart's take on rhythm. I particularly draw on his essay, The Echo of the Subject, hence the title of my seminar today, where Labarde traces connections between autobiography and music, deploying rhythm as a motive in tracing this connection. It is through autobiography that Laquel Labarde's interest in the subject or rather the writing subject, the subject that writes itself, as he puts it, is inscribed. In following psychoanalytic and philosophical trails in his explorations, La Laquella Bach proposes that it is music, and I quote here, that sets off the autobiographical gesture. End of quote. We all know that anyway. Every time that we start reminiscing when listening to a song or melody that triggers memory. Since music is prime then, it is no wonder that the subject is configured in terms of sounds, refrains and echoes. There is no rhythm without repetition, or shall we say refrains, for La Quella Bar. And in this light of thought, rhythm is taken, and I quote here, as the essence of the mimetic movement that echoes the subject to itself, end of quote. Indeed, for a psychoanalyst like La Quella Bar, 
the subject feels trapped in an uncanny world should rhythm vanish. In this light, if loss of rhythm means loss of the subject, and I quote again, rhythm could also be the condition of possibility for the subject. And consequently, we are constituted by this rhythm. As uh, Jacques Derrida has observed in his famous introduction to typography, um, typography is the volume that uh, includes many essays and the echo of the subject is one of them. In this context, laquella back notions of the echo refers to the ways language reverberates and resonates, suggesting that meaning and subjectivity emerge through a complex interplay of sounds, language, history, and culture. The subject then becomes entangled in this web of echoes constantly mediated by music, language, and inscription. And I quote again, every soul is a rhythmic knot. We are rhythmed, Laquella Bart notes, referring, of course, to Malarmes, La Musique et la Lettre. Here we have then, in a nutshell, what I have configured as the rhythm assemblage of my approach. Bachelard's instant and the continuity of the discontinuous, which is formed by the subject, as we have seen. Bergson's different rhythms and multiple durations. Deleuze and Gattery's refrain, as well as Laquella Bart's echo. In this philosophical background, rhythm is connected to both flow and form, to return to, to the etymology of the world that I was speaking about, and becomes a medium through which entanglements between forces of continuity and discontinuity can be felt and understood in reading women mathematicians' literary writings. There is, of course, an important body of scholarship around reading rhythm in literature. Whenever I read, I mentally pronounce an I, and yet the I which I pronounce is not myself. Uh, Georges Poulet has written in The Phenomenology of Reading. Uh, pro a prose has a pace. It is dotted with stops and pauses, frequent rests, inflections rise and fall like a low range of hills. Certain tones are prolonged. There are patterns of stress and harmonious measures. There is a proper method of pronunciation, even if it is rarely observed. William Gass has written in uh, Music uh, of Prose. Finally, Rebecca Wallbank has argued that rhythmic auditory imagery is prevalent within one's experience of literature, even if one is not attentive to it and can alter the tone, tenor and mood of an author's writings in a non-voluntary, non-foregrounded manner. So to put it simply, we are always engaged in rhythms when we read, whether we read prose or poetry or, or any other text, really. Of course, I can't expand more on this literature within the limitations of this webinar. Instead, I will focus on some examples from Sofia Kovalevskaya's literary writings to give you a feeling of this importance uh, of reading rhythm and, and what reading rhythm in literature can tell us about the subject. Sofia Kovalevskaya was the first woman professor in mathematics in modern Europe. 
uh, with significant contributions in the mathematical sciences. But alongside her scientific and mathematical work, she also wrote novels, poetry, and theatrical plays in full agreement with her PhD supervisor's Carl Weierstrass view that it is not possible to be a great mathematician without having the soul of a poet. Kovalevskaya was an exemplary cosmopolitan subject of her times and geographies. She was, go she was born and grew up in Russia, studied in Germany, lived in Paris for extended periods of time, and eventually settled down in Sweden, where she was offered an academic position in Stockholm University in 1894. The spatio-temporal rhythms of her lived experiences are thus beautifully entangled in the narrative modalities of her literary writings, and it is some of their flows, forces, and energies that uh, I will follow as a way of tuning into her existential need and indeed desire to make sense of two interrelated forces in her life. The Bergsonian continuity, her life as an aristocratic Russian woman, and discontinuities and ruptures, the Baselarian intuition of becoming a mathematician, her cosmopolitan wanderings in Europe, the intensity of her mathematical work, the fervor of her immersion in radical politics. She was standing next to her uh, sister Anuta during the Parisian Commune but also the struggle to become a professor in mathematics while also juggling with the demands of being a single mother because her, her husband uh, had died. Indeed, her literary writings allow a glimpse into the different temporalities that she experienced as a complex rhythmic interplay between break and flow permanence and flux, continuity and discontinuity. Let us then follow some tracks and traces of her spatio-temporal rhythms in her autobiography, where she paints the landscape of her childhood home in Palibino, the family state where they moved when she was eight years old, and the image you see here is the actual uh, is her actual home, which has now become a museum. And I quote here from her autobiography, A Russian Childhood. One side of our estate abutted upon wooded land almost to its very edge. At first, this wood was kept cleared and looking like a park. But little by little, it had grown denser and more impassable until at last it merged with the vast state forest. This latter extended over an area of hundreds of versts. No axe had ever sounded in it in the memory of man, except clandestinely, perhaps in the hands of some poaching peasant come to make off with government hood by, da by dark of night. Space time and the history of the Russian empire are entangled in these short but forceful descriptions of the hood, which is invested with folklore myths and popular imagination as it becomes denser and denser with the passing of time. The dissonance between the silence of the night and the sound of a peasant's axe, which steals, or shall we say reclaims, a tiny portion of their land rights, creates the soundscape of continuity and discontinuity. 
particularly in the context of the emancipation reform of 1861, which abolished serfdom in around the time that Kovalevskaya's family moved to Palibino. They actually moved there to protect it. And if we are to move to time rhythms, let's listen to their sound from her autobiography again. The wall clock in the, sec in the school room struck seven. These seven strokes reached my consciousness through my slumber and begat in me the sad conviction that Dunyasha, the maid, will be coming now at once to wake me. But I'm still sleeping so sweetly that I try to convince myself that I have only imagined those seven repulsive strokes. Turning on the other side and drawing the coverlet closer about me, I hasten to enjoy the sweet, brief bliss afforded by the last little moments of sleep, which, as I well know, will soon come to an end. Clock time of harsh seven repeated strokes is juxtaposed here to the Bergsonian durée of a child's time, an infinite moment of brief bliss, as we all remember from our endless childhood summers. Note how the rhythm of the clock both measures and regulates time, but also allows for the bliss of the instant, the last moment of sleep, the Bergsonian moment to be indulged. And thinking of time and temporalities, here we have a glimpse of her poetry. Now unfolds a different image in the changing scene I'm viewing of a tidy German village with a castle now in ruins. All the mountains outline softly and the chestnuts, lush and verdant, are enveloped in a misty, hazy blue, transparent curtain, green as boundless as the ocean and the sky of vivid azure I see whimsically patterned with great arches and with towers. Different worlds of signs have different rhythms. Deleuze has written about Proust in search of lost time. And indeed, different sensations are obtained by the fusion of different rhythms in this short stanza from April 13 in painting Heidelberg, the city where Kovalevskaya studied mathematics for the first time. When her years of study in Germany eventually ended with the award of her PhD in 1874, Kovalevskaya had to grapple with the untenable position of being a highly educated aristocratic woman but without prospects of being um, uh, of attaining an academic position in Russia. Her only complete novella, The Nihilist Girl, expresses this frustration through a dialogic rhythm between the narrator, herself, and Vera Baranchova, The Nihilist Girl. I was 22 years old when I moved to Petersburg. Three months earlier, I had graduated from a university abroad and returned to Russia, doctoral degree in hand. After five years of isolated, cloistered existence in a small university town, life in Petersburg immediately enveloped and, as it were, intoxicated me. Putting aside for a while the consideration of analytic functions, space and the four dimensions which had so recently obsessed me, I threw myself into new interests. I made acquaintances left and right, 
I tried to penetrate the most varied circles. With greedy curiosity, I turned my attention to all the essentially empty, but initially so engaging manifestations of the complex hubbub that we call life in Petersburg. In the genre of the Russian realist novel, the narrator's encounter with Vera Baranchova shakes off her world. Starting from Bazarov into Genev's Fathers and Sons, the figure of the nihilist played a central role in post-emancipation intellectual Russian life and is a recurring type in the fiction of that period. Nihilist attitudes always involved a strong belief in the unfettering of the individual, a personal revolt against social norms that were regarded as backwards and oppressive. Well before the publication of her novella, Kovalevskaya herself had a reputation as a nihilist, and it was because of this reputation that she was turned down for a professorship at Helsinki University. Following this literary tradition, but also her own autobiographical experiences, Kovalevskaya portrays Vera as an idealistic young gentrywoman who leaves behind the comforts of home and family to find autonomy and at the same time serve the radical cause. The scene at the end of the novella, where the narrator goes to the railway uh, station to see Vera off on her long journey to Siberia to be with a husband she had chosen to marry as a gesture of support and solidarity is telling of the nihilist attitude. Are you crying for me? said Vera with a bright smile. Oh, if only you knew how much I, on the contrary, pity all of you who are staying here. Those were her last words. By writing poetry, Kovalevskaya materialized her PhD supervisor's idea that a mathematician who is not somewhat of a poet will never be a perfect mathematician. But she did it through the support of a network of significant others, including uh, the mathematician Kostya Mita Gleffler, who first invited her to Stockholm University for a visiting academic position, which later became a tenured position. It was also in Stockholm that Kovalevskaya met Mita Gleffler's sister Carlotta, with whom they co-wrote two socially conscious theatrical plays, The Struggle for Happiness. Here, in the opening scene, Alisa, a Swedish aristocratic girl, uh, returns home from university studies, but she also already starts feeling the frustration that we have also encountered in the narrator of The Nihilist Girl, because her family have other plans for her. And we see here the dialogue between uh, uh, an invitee to a party and uh, um, um, Alisa's Aunt Amelia. What a lovely picture. Everyone is so happy to be welcoming our precious Alisa back home again, says Madame Selene. And Aunt Amelia responds, of course, it's wonderful. Our precious girl has always brought such life to, to this house. She has so many plans. Plans to organize schools, public lectures, and other projects to help the workers. I heard she performed brilliantly on the university exams. Yes, she had a good head on her shoulders. She's like her father. 
And since the good Lord hasn't seen fit to give my dear brother a son, it's a good thing that at least his daughter, so she will be continuing with classes at Uppsala. Oh, I'm hopeful that something very different could be happening in the near future, meaning her arranged marriage. Kovalevskaya lived a mobile life as a cosmopolitan subject, as we have already seen. But during the years of her academic position in Sweden, where she went as a widow after her husband's suicide, she also found a new love. Maxim Kovalevsky, a prominent sociologist and distant relative of her husband, had a villa in the Riviera, and it is the unfinished novella happening in the Riviera that carried traces of Kovalevskaya's last love in her own struggle for happiness. With a sharp and shrill whistle, the train took off from a tunnel near Genoa and rushed along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea towards Ventimiglia. It was the end of January. The morning was lovely and warm. On the blue background of the sky, white lambs roamed and the whole vicinity was constantly changing character and color. When the sun went behind the cloud, the sea suddenly darkened and twitched with a grey haze. But in a minute it sparkled again and took off. Rocks monotonously still and surrounding mountains took on a pink hue. Greyish green shimmered with silver. The sea was stained suddenly with countless different colours. Along the banks where the ground was sandy, there was a pale bluish stripe. A little further away, it turned into emerald green. Even further, the presence of an underwater rock was detected with a whole roll of small white scallops and behind the large sail, long glittering golden ripples stretched across a ship. And the novella goes on with beautiful narrations of nature uh, to show this anticipation of the young woman who leaves Russian and wants to, to get to know Europe. The different scenes on the train to Genoa invoke different sensations, which unfold through the fusion of the spatio-temporal rhythms in the novella. The monotone and staccato repetition of the train engine serves as the condition for a state of self-forgetfulness, which in turn allows for the experience of real duration. Rhythm thus function as an instrument of suggestion or a vector of hypnosis. Its repetition, which in itself is quantitative, makes the listener forget themselves and lulls them in a state where they experience the different strokes as one continuous melody, very much the Bacillarian rhythm. Rhythm, however, argues Bergson, functions as a tool to evoke duration. It is the quality of quantity. And it is here that I argue that the, the Bacillarian moment mingles with um, the Bergsonian durée. And actually, there has been a body of literature lately that is trying to bring Bergson and Bacillar together. To conclude then, Bacillar attempts to construct new rhythmic constellations in two figures that he holds in the highest esteem, the scientist and the poet. The scientist is the one who says no to tradition as 
she abandons the values and interests that guide our practical life. Similarly, the poet has the task to shatter, and I quote here from Baselar, the simple continuity of shackled time in order to make new temporalities arise, end of quote. Inhabiting both positions, the scientist and the poet, Kovalevskaya did not live to see her literary work published. She died from pneumonia in Stockholm in January 1891, soon after her journey from Riviera to Stockholm via Paris and Berlin. Thus, I chose this novella, this unfinished novella, as her last song. Her partner, Maxim Kovalevsky, however, took care of her literary work after her untimely death. Looking back at this work, I have discerned a striking continuum of how art, life, and science are mingled in her oeuvre. Kovalevskaya's literary continuum is thus entangled with her ex existential quests as expressed in her autobiography and letters, but also with her mathematical work where science and imagination have been closely intertwined. Through some quick glimpses in this literary continuum, the wandering subject in Kovalevskaya's literary writings emerges as an echo. For Baselar, the past is reduced to the retention or echo of what was. So Baselar also refers to the echo in his rhythm analysis. For Laquella Bart, however, the echo is much more than that. The echo is constitutive of the subject. The subject becomes entangled in a web of echoes, constantly mediated by language and its various echoes or repetitions. Split between the figures of the poet and the mathematician, Kovalevskaya becomes a rhythmic knot. She is rhythmed, to repeat Mallarmé here. Separated from the rhythm of her literary writings, Kovalevskaya's subjectivity is trapped in the myths, discourses and meta-narratives that have been constructed around her. Kovalevskaya as a subject is hesitant and undecidable because she must always confront two figures, the poet and the mathematician, and thus her and our only chance to grasp herself lies in introducing herself as oscillating between these two figures. What I therefore argue is that narrative rhythm analysis brings to the fore the catalytic role of space-time matter in literary creation, opening up new analytical paths and insights. As it engages with literary words and figures, narrative rhythm analysis can never be conclusive, however. It is rather a process constantly unearthing new signs and meanings around subjects or rather their echoes and their worlds, as my feminist genealogies over the years have shown. Thank you.